Today's guest is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, and in fact one of the most well-known economists of our time. He's a pioneer in behavioral economics and a champion of the experimental revolution, advocating the importance of conducting field experiments to understand what works, what doesn't work, and why. He has served as an economic advisor to the White House and a chief economist to large firms like Walmart and Uber. Earlier today, he gave the Life is a Lab lecture to an audience of faculty and students here at NHH on his new book, which is called The Voltage Effect. Welcome to Coffee with John List. Thanks so much for having me. We'll come back to Bergen. It's wonderful to be here. You just gave a talk, John, to an audience of students and faculty here at the Business School uh, about your latest book. The voltage effect it clearly has large implications for us as researchers when we design our experiments. Um, but you've been working closely with governments and, uh, and firms as well. Is this book also relevant to them? And what is your experience with working with governments and firms and the, the benefits and also the challenges? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Now, um, do we have an hour or two for me to, to answer that? Let, let, me, that let me give it a go. Okay, so for five minutes. Let, let me start off by, by talking broadly about the value proposition that academics bring to government and private firms. So most public and private entities have mounds and mounds of data. They're rich with data. And many people, therefore, say, because you have so much data, you can make informed decisions. Because they say uh, evidence-based policy and data-driven decisions. These are, these are all monikers that everyone wants to use. They want to wear that badge. And the more data, the better. More, more data, the better. Yeah. We're going to change the world because we have so much data. That's half the problem. Just having data does not help you. You need a good data refinery. And what I mean by that is you need academics. You need professionals who can bring critical thinking skills, who can bring data science skills to the task. Once you have a bunch of data in a good data refinery, now you're in business. If you have one without the other, you're done. That's what academics can bring to organizations, is a professional way to think about using and generating new data. There are a lot of secrets locked up in academic journals. That's why I wrote The Voltage Effect, is because I had been writing academic papers on scaling for years. But I was getting this sense that nobody was paying attention to it. So what do you do? You step back and you say, do I just throw my hands up and give up and move to my next topic? Or do you say, you know what? I want to take a shot at changing the world, so I'm going to write a popular book. And I'm going to make sure the message is digestible. And I'm going to unlock the secrets that are in academic journals. Right? The way we write is economies. Nobody outside of economics can understand economies. So it takes translators sometimes to understand the economies, take the jargon out, take all the math out, and say, here's what we've learned. And that's what academics who go and work in governmental organizations, go and work in private firms, can do. OK, let's talk about the voltage effect now. So when I talk to firms about thinking like an economist. That's basically a running thread in the voltage effect. Here are some tips how you can think like an economist. All of the governments and uh, government folks and business people who have read it so far love that aspect. The other part that they've liked is they have always viewed scaling as an art. Think about it. Move fast and break things. 
throw spaghetti against the wall, whatever sticks, you cook it. Um, fake it till you make it. These are all slogans that startups and entrepreneurs use. That's art. That's an artistic way to think about scaling. There is way too much money at stake, both with public dollars and private dollars, to rely on art to help us make decisions on what gets scaled and how it gets scaled. Implementation in scaling is a science. And my book brings forward the economic science to help explain what we need to understand to scale ideas. Now, your audience might not like my science. That's fine. Eschew my science, but bring your own. Because this topic is important enough that we need all of the top minds in the world working on the science of scaling. For too long, we have viewed this as it's the pearls before the swine. So what I mean by that is there's an old biblical passage, the pearls before the swine. In this case, it was you do the innovation, you have the idea, that's the pearls. And then the swine is scaling it. It's for the lesser minds. It's ridiculous because scaling is as important or more important today than the original idea generation. We need to add science to scaling. Yeah, but is that enough? Uh, just to, uh, informing policymakers about the, the, the simple truths of economics, like thinking on the margin and so on, uh, or the concept of randomization. Is that enough to, you know, to make things happen? Surely there must be other obstacles out there oh, gosh. Which, which stop gosh. scaling. Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's be clear. It's a start. So you have to start somewhere. And I think the highest value place to start is where you have a lot of $100 bills sitting on the ground. And in many cases, that's just, just think on the margin. If you want to expand, expand in the areas where the marginal values are the highest. If you want to contract, contract in the areas where the marginal values are the lowest. That's marginal thinking. If you want to make decisions using data, make sure that the data you use are causal. And make sure to understand, if it's not causal, what you can learn from it. We always want a data-generated decision, but if the data are not causal in, in revealing important ways, it's like pushing against a string. It's, it's doing something that you have no idea if it will work or not. So I think you start with the principles, and then you move to institution or organizational specific problems that they have. One government might have a problem of early education. They might be concerned about whether we should take early education to four and five-year-olds. That's a question we can answer. Another government might be concerned about UBI, universal basic income. They might say, what are the economic ramifications of having a universal basic income? We can answer all these types of questions. But in many cases, you need to generate new data. And understanding how to generate those data, that's what people like you and me are experts at. And if we can bring that expertise to these organizations, we at least have a chance to change the world for the better. And what have you learned as a researcher from working so closely with governments and firms? Organizations contain as much information for us is what we contain for them. I think about each relationship in a symbiotic way because each time I work with an organization, I learn a ton. I learn a ton not only about where does the economic theory have a deficiency? You know, where do we need to do better in the economic modeling? All the way from, I learn a ton about what are the secrets that this organization contains? What are the secrets that the data within the government um, contain that we can work with and write about and help other people around the world? So it's both informative for me on the one hand of 
understanding where our models have shortcomings. I start with standard neoclassical economics and then I go to behavioral economics. I think about it as behavioral economics complements standard neoclassical theory in very important ways. And you need both of them to make better and more informed decisions. So I think organizations help from the theoretical or the abstract sense all the way up to there are a lot of secrets in organizations. And once we have the chance to work with these organizations, we can unlock very important and deep secrets. John, in 2014, um, a few years back. Yeah, a few years. Yeah. A few gray hairs ago. <laughs> you, you gave the first uh, Life is a Lab lecture together with Eurogenes here at NHH on your first book, uh, The Y Axis, which is basically about the importance of field experiments. Now you have this new book on how to design field experiments for scale. Where do you see yourself moving as a researcher? What, what will your next be, book be all about? Yes, yes, yes. Um, can I give two? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna unwind two. So I'm gonna start with human capital formation. So for those of you who don't understand what human capital formation means, it's economies for what are the best ways to raise our children. And here in my mind, you have five critical periods, and it starts prenatally, and it goes to the delivery room. It goes to pre-kindergarten, it goes to kindergarten, to eighth grade, it goes to adolescence, and then it goes to early adulthood. In each of these places, my team, the team here, and other teams around the world have made great discoveries. And they've made great discoveries not only for individuals. And I'm here I'm talking about giving advice to parents. So I have eight kids. When you have a child, what happens is the child comes out, everyone congratulates you, they whisk the child away, and they test the child for any abnormalities, and they give the child some vaccinations. You leave the hospital with a vaccination schedule. It says you should bring your child back in six months, and then for the 12-month checkup, they give you a playbook for the medical care or the medical side of raising your child. But they don't give you a playbook for raising and growing your child's brain. I walked out with my first child, Annika, and I looked at my wife and I said, now what do we do? What are we supposed to do with this kid? Nobody gave me the playbook. Nobody even today gives people the playbook. But we have learned a lot about what are the best ways to grow your child's brain. And from zero to three, this is a very critical time period. So we're embarking on some research where we're developing wearable technologies. So the, these wearable technologies will document all of the interaction between caretaker and child, and then we'll use a machine learning algorithm, some AI, to figure out what are the best interactions that lead to later future great outcomes. That's going to be part of the first the first half here is we can talk about what should we do as parents? What's the playbook? All the way from the crib to Cambridge, we have a playbook. <laughs> now, that sounds like the title of the next That book. sounds like the title. <laughs> I, I was thinking Lost Einsteins because we lose so many Einsteins. There are so many great kids with great potential that never had the chance because their parents didn't know what to do especially in underserved communities. So if I'm saying this from a place of privilege, you and I have won the lottery of life. We had a great shot of fulfilling our potential. Most kids don't. Okay, so, so that's one kind of book that I've been thinking about, and that will be part parental advice and then part governmental advice. Because at each of these stages, we have to develop policies that scale. And that's how it comes back to this book. Now. The other thing I've been toying with is a book on generosity. I don't think 
we define and view generosity in the correct way. I don't believe that we fully understand why isn't there more crime? When you think about the proposition of committing a crime, if you just do cost-benefit analysis and forget about everything else, we should have a lot more crime. But we don't because there's a social cohesion and a social fabric about you don't take every time you have a chance to take. If you think about generosity through an opportunity set or opportunity cost, it gives you very different insights on a generous act and what that represents. And it also gives you very different insights on what are the mechanisms or the institutions a government can think about to promote generosity and to attenuate things like sabotage and uh, employee theft. So that's the opposite side of the generosity coin. And I've been doing work in philanthropy for 25 years, work along the lines of why do people give to charitable causes? Why do people donate their time, donate their money? I think it's time to unlock some of those secrets in a book on generosity. So I think the next time I'm here, which I hope is in a few years, um, if I do write a popular book, it will be in one of these areas, either Lost Einsteins or a new way to think about generosity. John, we look forward to uh, following your fascinating research agenda and, uh, and uh, reading your next book or books and welcome you back to NHH. It's been a pleasure, John. Thanks so much for having me.